So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today is part two of the Matthew Shepard case. So if you haven't caught part one, you kind of need to watch that one first before you can watch part two, otherwise this won't make any sense. I'll link it up here in the eye, go watch that one and then come right back to this tab and we'll continue the story together. But quickly before we get into part two of this case, I do just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible, NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network service that I personally use every single day and have done for years now to keep myself and all of my information safe when I'm using the internet. It works by making making it appear as though you're operating from a different IP address than the one you actually are. And this other IP address acts as a barrier between you and all of your information that you wanna keep safe and other people that might be trying to access it or hack you in your accounts. And this new IP address can be from over 60 different countries. Wherever you wanna choose to be, then you can be there. And this in itself comes with a whole load of benefits because you get to access the internet as though you're actually in that country. So all of their streaming service selections you get access to. I personally use America a lot because I love their Netflix selection. They have a bigger selection. Even things like YouTube videos that have been blocked in your country. I know a lot of my videos have been blocked in different countries on copyright grounds and I know a lot of my friends, YouTuber friends, have that same issue. So if there's a video that you want to try and watch, that's a way to get around it. But going back to the safety thing, please, 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 if you use public Wi-Fi, if I can give you any piece of advice, it is please use a VPN. You never know how secure those free public Wi-Fi services are and you never know what could happen to you and your information when you're using them. I use them all the time. I go to cafes to do my work. I do my work on the train, but I always make sure that I'm protected with a VPN and you should too. So if you wanna get protected online, NordVPN are very kindly offering you guys a huge discount off of a two year plan plus four additional months for free. All you have to do to grab that deal is go through the link down below in the description. That's nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor and use the code Eleanor at checkout. Don't say I don't treat you because that is an amazing deal. Four months free and a huge discount. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I do just wanna remind you of the content warnings that we talked about in part one. There are a lot, so I'm just gonna sit and list them off now. And if you hear anything that might upset you or affect you in any way, please do click out of this video because your well-being is the most important thing here. I'm sure I'll catch you another time with a different case that's maybe a bit more suitable for you, but the content warnings are as follows. Sexual assault, rape, torture, homophobia, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations, general struggles with declining mental health and body shaming. So now before we get into part two, I'm just gonna give you a quick little summary of what happened in part one and that'll just help us flow into the case a little bit better. Matthew Shepard was a 21 year old openly gay college student from Wyoming who was brutally tortured and murdered on October 6th, 1998. He was found tied by his hands to a book rail fence on a country road in the middle of nowhere. He was in and out of consciousness. He was barely clinging to life. He'd been beaten so severely that his skull was fractured. He had injuries to his brain stem that would have left him disabled had he survived. He was in a coma for six days, but eventually passed away. So police are investigating what is now a murder. Now that Matthew passed away, this is now a murder inquiry. And they got their first major lead in this case in the form of an entirely different investigation. On the same night that Matthew was beaten and tortured, police responded to another incident in that same area. This was a street fight between two drug dealers and two other men. The fight was easily dispersed, people were sent to hospital or holding cells, and then the police decided to search the truck of two of the drug dealers that were involved in this fight. And when they looked through the front window of this truck, they saw something laying on the dashboard. It was a credit card, but that credit card wasn't under either of these drug dealers' names. It was under a completely different name. Police read the name and they didn't know who it was, so they quickly theorized that it was stolen. They took that name back to the police station and they ran it up on the system to see if anyone had reported a credit card stolen, and they found that this card actually belonged to Matthew Shepard. But at this point in time, police had no idea who Matthew Shepard was, that he'd been beaten or tortured or tied to a fence. They knew none of that. So they didn't really know what finding this credit card meant. They didn't realize just how serious it was 
until a couple of days down the line. Once Matthew was found and his case started making headlines, national news all over America, police that found that credit card suddenly realised the gravity of the situation. They had found this murder victim's stolen card in the car of these two men. What did this mean for the investigation? Also, if you remember, there were two sets of footprints around where Matthew was found tied to the fence. Police knew that they were looking for two attackers and they'd just found two drug dealers in possession of his card. Things were all adding up. Could these two men, Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney, could they be the killers? On the night that police were called out to that street fight with Henderson and McKinney, they seized McKinney's gun that he used to hit one of the men over the head. So they decided to send this gun to a lab for forensic testing because it had blood all over it and they wondered whose this blood was. After a couple of days, a match came back to Matthew Shepard. So now not only was his stolen bank card found in their car, but his blood was found all over their gun. This now made Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney prime suspects in the murder and torture of Matthew Shepard. But who were these two men? All we know of them right now is that they were drug dealers. So let's go into a little bit of their history. Russell Henderson had lived there in Laramie for most of his life. He'd moved there after his parents divorced when he was still very, very young and he'd never left the city. He moved in with his grandmother. She too had lived there all her life. So there was no urge for them to get out. And I mean, they were happy. They were happy in Laramie. He had quite a happy, time at his grandmother's. He loved her. He enjoyed living there. When he was nine years old, he did try to move back in with his biological mother to try and give things another go with his actual parent, but things didn't go very well. They argued all the time. They got on each other's nerves. They just didn't get on. And so Russell Henderson was moved back to his grandmother's house, but this time it was permanent. His grandmother was a very strict Christian and so she raised Russell Henderson in those teachings, in those views. She would take him to church all the time and he enjoyed it. He loved going to church and doing all the prayers and the Sunday school and making friends. Overall, Henderson was just a very good kid, to be honest. I mean, he did really well in school. He even made the honor roll in his class. On a number of occasions, actually, it wasn't just once. He was just a really good kid. He was very social. He had a ton of friends. All his life, he'd had a ton of friends. Like when he was younger, he was in the Boy Scouts and oh my God, was he brilliant at that. He was so passionate about it. He loved everything to do with the Boy Scouts, the outdoors, the adventuring, the camping, earning badges and stuff like that. He thrived in Boy Scouts. He was super well behaved in Scouts as well. And he ended up earning the highest honor possible, which is Eagle Scout, I believe. What a great kid Russell Henderson was. His childhood, everything was brilliant. And uh, apart from that one little blip with his mother that they didn't really get on, but he really enjoyed living with his grandmother. Everything was looking so positive for this boy. But then when he reached 17 years old, when he entered his senior year of high school, that is where things drastically started to go downhill for Henderson. It's unclear what the root cause of this was. It seemed like there were no other factors in his life that were making him just suddenly badly behaved or not care about school. A lot of people have theorized that maybe it was the idea of almost finishing school. Like he was scared to leave school. He was scared of that change, to be out in the world. And so he decided that he was gonna spend his last year of high school not caring, not paying attention, not behaving. He was gonna just act out for the last year. So that's exactly what he did. He stopped trying, he stopped going into school most days and his grades dropped dramatically. This was that really well-behaved, kind, passionate, driven, friendly, social boy, he just completely flipped all of that on his head. Even his grandmother noticed how much Henderson was changing and it was so disappointing to her because she'd practically raised this boy. Well, she had. And now what was happening to him? This was not the boy that she raised. This was not the boy that she took to church all those weekends. And when the time came for Henderson's graduation, he fell short. He couldn't graduate. He was just one credit away from graduating. And this completely eliminated his chances of going to any of the good colleges that he wanted to go to. And Henderson actually chose not to resit his senior year. He turned down 
the second chance that he needed to graduate and then go off to a good college. He was given a second chance, but he didn't want to do it. He didn't want an education anymore. But because he didn't have an education or any qualifications, that meant he couldn't get a job. And so began Russell Henderson's life of crime. He started committing loads of different crimes in order to just have money to live. And it was around this time that Russell Henderson started to drink and do drugs quite often. I mean, at first it was just like a social thing with his friends, but then he very quickly started to form some dependencies and addictions. He started drinking every single day. He was smoking weed every day and then that eventually led to harder and harder drugs. And this was when Russell Henderson was introduced to Aaron McKinney because Aaron McKinney was a drug dealer and he was the one that was supplying Russell Henderson with all of his weed. And since Russell Henderson smoked so much, the two of them just ended up like, hanging out together. They would smoke together. Whenever Russell would go and buy from McKinney, they would sit and smoke it together. And so eventually the two of them became really close friends, but this friendship was so bad for both of them. They both made each other worse. Like they both took more drugs when they were together. They did worse drugs when they were together. They committed worse crimes when they were together. They both just accelerated each other's behaviors. And not only were they doing harder drugs together, but they were also making harder drugs together. They both started to cook and sell meth. Similarly to Russell Henderson, Aaron McKinney also had quite a decent start in life. His life was looking promising as well. His family were financially comfortable when he was growing up. So he wasn't rich by any means, but they also weren't just scraping by either. Whatever he wanted, he would get within reason. I mean, they weren't spoiling him, but if he needed something, it wasn't a struggle. Although the problems in Aaron McKinney's life were rooted in his parents' behavior. He would witness arguments and fights and his parents screaming at each other almost every single day. These fights were often very explosive. Like when they happened, it was a big event and the whole house knew that it was going on. The whole street knew that it was going on. And sometimes these verbal fights would escalate into physical abuse. It was never one-sided though. If his mother hit his father, his father would hit her right back. Same the other way around. If the father hit the mother, she would hit him right back. They would have equal fights. It wouldn't be one person abusing the other. That being said, this physical abuse was never anything too extreme. I hate to say it like that because physical abuse is physical abuse, but it was more just like, they were more just kind of like push each other in arguments or push each other out of the room or I don't know. It was never like fist fighting, punching in the face kind of fighting, but it was, it was still physical, you know, moving the other person and stuff. Obviously still not good for a child to watch. That's not good for a child to watch their parents pushing each other, like physically putting their hands on each other. But it wasn't like he was witnessing fist fights, you know? But it was when McKinney got to school that the real problems began because he was bullied by this other boy when he was about six or seven years old. I don't know exactly what this bullying would be. I don't know if it was verbal, physical. I don't know what this boy did to Aaron McKinney apart from one particular incident where one day in the playground, this bully forced Aaron McKinney to perform oral sex on him when he was like seven. I think it goes without saying that being raped by his bully at the age of seven years old had a huge effect on Aaron McKinney. He became withdrawn, his mental health declined so rapidly. He was just no longer the same child that he'd always been. He started acting out, he was badly behaved. He was badly behaved in school especially. Although this was about as far as it went. He didn't get so bad that he was like skipping school or causing fights or anything. He would just act out. He was just a like a naughty child. When he was about nine or 10 years old, his parents divorced and his mother remarried when he was 13. And so Aaron and his mother moved across Laramie to the east side to move in with his mother's new husband. And this area was a lot more posh and wealthy than what Aaron McKinney was used to. This was like a middle class area where he'd always been in a working class area. It was 
really safe, it was really nice, and he liked living there. He liked his new living situation. But for some reason, it was around this time when he was about 13, 14, when his behaviour outside of school started to worsen and he started committing petty crimes. In his early teenage years, he was in and out of juvenile detention centres all the time for theft and, I don't know, other things. I don't actually know what he did. But then in 1993, when Aaron McKinney was probably in his mid-teens at this point, his life was turned upside down when his mother passed away very unexpectedly as well. She went in for surgery and just didn't wake up. Her surgery was botched and she passed away on the operating table. This was such a surprise to everyone. Two years later, Aaron McKinney received $100,000 in compensation for his mother's botched surgery that led to her death. Of course, he was gonna be compensated quite a large amount of money for that because something must have seriously gone wrong there for that to have happened but Aaron McKinney got this payout and wasted every single penny of it. $100,000 could set you up for life if you invest it or use it properly, but he decided to spend it all on drugs and nights out and gambling. He did buy some semi-useful things like a car. I mean, that is useful, but it's also a depreciating asset that you're just gonna end up losing money on. He didn't buy a house. He didn't, you know, set up a business, anything like that. He didn't buy anything that held any value. And so when all of this money ran out, Aaron McKinney just went back to committing crimes because that was all he knew. But now it was way bigger things than it was in his early teens, back when he used to just like steal something from the shop. Now he was like robbing the shop owner, getting everything out of the till, like, he was quite scary. He would mug people on the street, beat them up, things like that. Like he was a very dangerous person. It was around this time in his life as well that he developed a really harsh temper. Like he was known for being a very angry man all the time. In his late teens, that was when McKinney started to deal drugs, just weed. And he had quite a small client base, one of which gave him the nickname Dopey because McKinney was known to have pretty big ears and also he's, selling weed, so. And like I said, it was then when McKinney met Henderson and the two of them were terrible, terrible influences on each other. And from that point, both of their lives just spiraled out of control. They ended up with more addictions and dependencies from spending so much time together. These dependencies were on even worse and worse and worse substances as time went on. And that brings us back to the timeline that Matthew Shepard has been tortured and murdered and now police have evidence to say that Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney, these two seemingly unrelated drug dealers, now it seems like they're the murderers. So the day after Matthew was found and brought to the hospital, police went out to try and arrest Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney. Henderson was the first one they found, literally just at his house. He was just in a trailer park. He lived in a trailer with his girlfriend, Chastity Paisley. They literally just knocked on the door Russell came to the door and they arrested him then and there. He refused to speak. He exercised his right to silence. In fact, the only thing he said the whole time was that he wanted a lawyer. And then after that, he was zipped. So in the meantime, as some of the police were taking Henderson back to the police station, they were reading him his rights, all that kind of stuff. Other police stayed at the trailer to interview his girlfriend, Chastity. And they wanted to find out like her alibi, where she'd been on the night of Matthew's murder, stuff like that. And she told the police that her and Henderson had literally just been together. They'd just been at home that night, just watching TV. But police already knew that this was a lie because remember they'd literally been called out to the street fight that Henderson and McKinney were in. That was how they even found out that these two men could potentially be involved. But she's saying that her boyfriend was at home with her all night. Why is she lying? Why is she covering for him? So police confronted her with this and they were like, um, no, we don't believe that. And so she tried to retract that alibi and give them another one, but they were like, nah, nah, nah. At this point, we don't even want it. We don't even need it. We know that you're lying. Aaron McKinney was arrested a couple of days after Russell Henderson because he'd actually been sent to hospital after the street fight. He must have had some semi-serious injuries. He'd actually spent four days in the same specialist head injuries unit that Matthew Shepard was laying in, in a coma. The whole time, nobody knew that these two men that were just a few beds away from each other were connected and that one of them 
was potentially the reason for the other one's death. So when police arrested Aaron McKinney, they wanted to go and speak to his girlfriend as well. His girlfriend was called Kristen Price. She was 19 years old, the mother of his son. And she was a little bit more honest with the police. She said that on the night of Matthew Shepard's murder, McKinney wasn't home. She didn't know where he was all night. She was just at home with their son. But she did say that she went to bed alone. She fell asleep in bed alone. She didn't know where McKinney was. And then she woke up around 1 a.m. to some noises coming from the back of the house. She opened her eyes. McKinney still wasn't in bed with her. He hadn't come home. And so she went to go figure out what these noises were. So she's creeping around the house thinking that they're being broken into, thinking that someone is trying to rob her house. And then she gets into the kitchen and sees her boyfriend, Aaron McKinney, climbing in through their window at 1am. She said that his clothes were covered in blood and that he was rambling about how he and Henderson had gotten into a fight and killed someone. She didn't believe him at the time. She thought that he was exaggerating. He was very drunk and clearly on a lot of drugs at the time as well. So she just kind of dismissed what he was saying. But now that police had come to speak to her, she was really worried about what McKinney had been saying to her that night. It seemed that maybe he had killed someone. On October 9th, 1998, so this was two days after Matthew was found, he's in the hospital, he's not dead yet, Aaron McKinney was brought in for a police interrogation. Obviously, after his girlfriend's statement that he'd come crawling through the window at 1am covered in blood talking about how he'd killed someone, they wanted to speak to him ASAP. And so they got him in this room, they got a tape recorder on and everything. And surprisingly enough, he sat there and admitted it all. And throughout this interview, police were horrified to hear how homophobic Aaron McKinney actually was. Like the first thing he even said about Matthew Shepard was that he was gay. Although I don't think he said it like that. He was using a whole plethora of homophobic slurs and statements and comments all the way through this interrogation, none of which will be repeated on this channel, but I'm sure you can imagine. Although he did make it clear to police that he doesn't hate gay people. He only hates it when they try and come on to him because he's not interested in men. And he says that when gay men do come on to him, they do try and flirt with him, it makes him really angry. But police didn't believe this for one second that he didn't hate gay people. He only hated it when they came on to him after he'd just spent the last half an hour saying all these different homophobic slurs, all these different comments, like, it was clear that this man was just homophobic, just in general. So now with statements from Aaron McKinney, both girlfriends, all the forensic evidence that they have from the crime scene and from the gun and all this kind of stuff, police were able to put together a theorized timeline of events of the night of Matthew Shepard's attack, his torture. It was October 6th, 1998, and Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney were on their way home from work. They'd both actually got themselves a legit part-time job, believe it or not. They weren't just drug dealing. They kind of did that on the side for more money, but they'd picked up some manual laborer jobs. At the moment, they were fitting roofs, and so they were on their way home from work when they drove past the Fireside Lounge, where Matthew Shepard and all of his friends already were after their meeting. And the Fireside Lounge was quite a lively place. It was quite a popular place in Laramie. And as the two men drove past, they saw how lively it was. They saw the queues outside and whatever. And like I said, at this point, they were still dealing drugs on the side. And so they saw this packed out bar and they were like, perfect, perfect opportunity to go and sell. So they decided to pull in and go in for a drink or two and try and sell as many drugs as they possibly could. But drugs weren't the only thing that Henderson and McKinney were trying to sell that night. They also had a gun on them that they were trying to shift that they didn't want. One of their clients had actually paid for their drugs from McKinney and Henderson using this gun rather than money, like they gave him a gun instead. And Henderson and McKinney didn't actually want a gun. They had no use for firearms, they wanted the money. And so they were gonna take this gun and sell it on for more money. And they were hoping that maybe someone in the Fireside Lounge might, I don't know, want a gun? Who goes to a bar and 
buys a gun while they're there. So the two men went inside the bar, they went and sat down together, and at some point during the night, they spotted Matthew Shepard sitting with all of his friends by the bar, and McKinney said in his statement to the police that he could tell that Matthew and all of his friends were gay just by looking at them. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but apparently they could, and so when they watched the rest of the group leave, and it was just Matthew sat at the bar, the men came up with a plan. So Henderson and McKinney ran off to the bathroom to go and formulate this plan, and that was that they were gonna pretend to be gay, and they were gonna pretend to be interested in Matthew. They were gonna go over, sit at the bar, flirt with him so much that they could pick him up, you know, take him out of the bar, take him home under the pretense that they were gonna have sex, but then they were just gonna rob him of all of his money. So the two men formulated this plan and they left the bathroom and they didn't go and sit back where they had been sat at this table, they went and joined Matthew at the bar. And they said that they wanted to make sure that they looked gay. And so how do you look gay? you start playing up all the stereotypes, of course. They pitched up their voices, made them a bit more effeminate, they limped their wrists, they were doing all these kind of gestures that they deemed to look gay, just so that they could come across as gay to Matthew. I think it's quite comical that, that any of that even happened. Anyway, these two straight men are pretending to be gay at the bar and they go over to Matthew and they're flirting with him and they're buying him drinks. They're trying to get him as drunk and inebriated as they possibly could because they knew that they were gonna take him home and rob him and they wanted him to be kind of out of it so that it'd be easy to rob him. And that is exactly what happened because later that night, Matthew was seen being almost carried out of the bar by Henderson and McKinney. All three of them headed back to McKinney's truck, of course, with Matthew believing that he was gonna go and have a good night with these two men. Why would he not believe that, you know? So Matthew Shepard and Aaron McKinney are sat in the back of the truck while Russell Henderson is driving. He drives them all the way out to a country lane. It's like in the middle of nowhere and then he stops the car. And it was then that the mood completely changed. Aaron McKinney turned to Matthew Shepard and said, guess what? We're not gay and we're gonna jack you up. The two of them started beating Matthew Shepard. They stole everything he had, all his money, his ID, his everything, his card. And then the two men just got out of the truck and left him slumped in the back, injured, very, very drunk. So he couldn't have even fought them back. He can't make any attempt to escape really right now. And so he's just laying there in the back seat. Henderson and McKinney both just got out of the truck. And Aaron McKinney claims that what he did next, he only did because Matthew Shepard sexually assaulted him. This is what Aaron McKinney says. He said that on the drive there to this dirt track, Matthew had been rubbing McKinney's leg, trying to put his hand down his pants, which I mean, I'm not gonna say much more about because we weren't there, we don't know what happened, but I do also want to remind you of the context of this situation, that these two men were lying to Matthew Shepard that they were gay and that they wanted to get with him and that they were gonna go home and have sex. So, I mean, those actions, if Matthew did do that, think of the context. But then again, we don't know the energy and the atmosphere of that car. We don't know the exact situation, so I'm not gonna say anymore. So anyway, McKinney says that he only did what he was about to do because of what Matthew had done in the car. Aaron McKinney gets out of the truck and walks around to where Matthew is sat. So now he's on the outside of the car from where Matthew is. He swung open the door, grabbed Matthew, pulled him out, and then dragged him down the road. And by now, Matthew was at a point where he could start fighting back. He started screaming. He was trying to like push McKinney off him and like kick him and just, just try to get away. But he was very, very drunk. He was very badly beaten from what they'd just done to him in the car. And so he couldn't physically get him off him. And sadly, this was the middle of nowhere and so no one could hear Matthew Shepard's cries for help. His physical strength was just no match for Aaron McKinney's and Russell Henderson's. It was two men against Matthew, and Matthew was about to be subjected to a prolonged, heinous, brutal attack. The men threw him against the fence, and McKinney got out his gun, though again, he didn't use it to shoot, he used it to hit Matthew nearly 20 times 
over the head. And this was so brutal that it just completely bashed Matthew's face to bits. I mean, I said he wasn't even recognisable in the hospital and that's no exaggeration. His skull was fractured in four places from this. That tells you how hard McKinney was hitting him. At one point, as McKinney was hitting him, Henderson even grabbed Matthew and held him down on the ground so that McKinney could I don't know, get a better angle. Matthew Shepard did have bruises all over his hands and arms. So maybe he was trying to defend his head from being hit with this gun. Maybe that's why Henderson pinned him down. Cause like I say, he couldn't overpower the men, but maybe he was getting in the way when he was trying to defend himself. The men said that Matthew begged and pleaded for his life right from the very start of this attack all the way through to the bitter end. He was begging them to stop. He was telling them that he would take them back to his house and they could rob his whole house. He had more money at home. They could take whatever they wanted, but just to give him his life, but they didn't care. At one point, it seems that Matthew managed to get away from his attackers. I don't know if Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney just thought that he wouldn't try and run away. Maybe they turned their backs for a minute and then Matthew got up and managed to stagger 50 feet down the road. Quickly, the men realized that he'd gotten away. They ran back over to him, tackled him to the ground, and then dragged him back to that same spot down by the fence. And there they decided to tie him up so that he couldn't get away again. They tied his hands together and then behind his back and then tied him to this book rail fence. And then McKinney hit him one last time over the head. It was at this point after this final hit that Matthew Shepard fell unconscious. Maybe the men thought they'd killed him, but with that, they left. For the next 18 hours, Matthew Shepard was left tied to that fence, slumped over in the cold, in the freezing winds, injured, bleeding, his skull fractured in four places. He is just slumped there, feeling this pain, for 18 hours until he was found. His funeral was held not long after his death on October 16th, 1998. And my God, was it clear just how many people loved Matthew Shepard. Almost 700 people attended this funeral, 700. The church was packed full. There were people spilling out into the churchyard, spilling out onto the street. They were having to like listen in through speakers. Matthew had impacted so many other lives in his 21 years on this earth and his death impacted even more than that. And so, so many people wanted to come down to show their respects to this man that had changed their lives. But not everyone that attended the funeral was there to pay their respects. Matthew Shepard's family in his passing had received a lot of hate. Just from random strangers that had come across this story, horrible, horrible people that would get in contact with his grieving parents to tell them that Matthew deserved to be tortured and murdered because of his sexuality. I can't imagine how painful this must have been in the days after their son's murder to be receiving horrible threats day in, day out. It was so bad that they actually had to have a full SWAT team and bomb screenings done at the funeral because people were threatening to do things at this funeral. People were threatening to attack. It was becoming a political thing. You know, people wanted to go down to the funeral to show their stance on, on homosexuality. For the most part, the actual funeral was safe. No one ended up turning up to like cause harm to anyone, but there was one man and his followers that appeared. Fred Phelps from the Westboro Baptist Church uh, already so many of you, as soon as I say that name, as soon as I say the Westboro Baptist Church, you know what's about to happen. If you're not aware of the work of the Westboro Baptist Church, count yourself lucky. They do protests all the time. They're anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, homophobic, every single phobic that you can possibly think of. This group are, they are horrible and they like to make it known. On the day of Matthew Shepard's funeral, Fred Phelps arrived at the church with a group of his followers, which included children, by the way, they were bringing children to do this kind of thing, and they started protesting. They were protesting against gay rights and against homosexuality in general at 
this 21 year old boy's funeral. They were celebrating the fact that someone that they deemed to be like an evil sinner, they were celebrating the fact that that person had been tortured and killed and eliminated from this earth. They held up signs with homophobic slurs and oh God, it was just horrendous. I can't imagine how it must have felt to have been one of Matthew's loved ones to see that his send off was being turned into this. This is something that the Westboro Baptist Church do quite often. If there's like a notable death of someone in the LGBT community or any other community that they disapprove of for that matter, they'll go down there, they'll make signs, they will turn this day of of grieving this person into their own political thing. They say that people like Matthew's death was a punishment from God for their bankrupt values. But Matthew Shepard's family dealt with this in the most amazing way. They just didn't even acknowledge it. They literally just ignored Fred Phelps, his followers, their protests, their signs. They ignored it. They didn't fight back, they didn't shout back. They literally just didn't even make eye contact. Instead, they decided to get up there on that microphone and speak to those 700 people about how Matthew was now becoming the face of the gay rights movement in America. Because after his murder, he was. This was national news and LGBT communities all over the country were fighting for Matthew. They were talking about Matthew. They were so passionate about making sure that he got justice and that his case was heard. Judy Shepard stood up at Matthew's funeral and said, he used to ask me if he would be famous one day. I guess he got there. She also talked about how proud she was of her son and all of the progress that he'd made in terms of his mental health after the very traumatic incident that he went through in Morocco. She said, we just felt like he was finally coming round to being himself again and then this happened. His mother was obviously so heartbroken at the tragic way that Matthew had lost his life and the torture that he'd endured in his final hours. But she was also inspired watching the LGBT communities from all over the country band together to demand change and fight for acceptance in Matthew Shepard's memory. Like I said, he was the new face of gay rights campaigns but well, worldwide almost, not even just nationwide in America, worldwide. Even though the police at the time were refusing to call what had happened to Matthew a hate crime. How was it not? Matthew had been targeted by Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney because of his sexuality. They used his sexuality against him to lure him in and then beat him torture him, murder him. McKinney's police statements, he's even using all these different homophobic slurs and comments and remarks. How was this not a hate crime? How was Matthew not murdered because of his sexuality? How, how? I don't know how they could make that conclusion and it makes me really angry. But anyway, it was around this time when his funeral was going on and everything that his killers, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson, were finally charged with first degree murder, kidnapping and robbery. And this first degree murder charge meant that both of these men could be up for the death penalty if they were found guilty. Both the boys' girlfriends, Chastity Paisley and Kristen Price were both charged with being an accessory to murder. Chastity obviously lied to the police so she was worse than Kristen, but Kristen hadn't gone to the police when her boyfriend came crawling through the window covered in blood saying that he'd killed someone she should have told someone then and there, but she didn't. And so for that reason, she was charged because she withheld that information for a while. All four of these people were charged separately, starting with Russell Henderson. Police knew that Russell Henderson hadn't been the actual person to kill Matthew. They knew that that was Aaron McKinney. He was the one holding the gun, beating him over the head with the gun. That was Aaron. Henderson, on the other hand, was the one that was holding Matthew down as McKinney did all of this. And there's blood evidence to prove the fact that he did that. He definitely held down Matthew. There's like splashes on his jacket and everything. So that we know is fact because we've got evidence to prove it. But the rest of Henderson's story, we don't know because it's literally just one man against the other 
I suppose. Henderson told the police that he did actually try to stop the attack against Matthew after McKinney had hit him so many times. Henderson looked at Matthew Shepard in the face and saw how disfigured he had become, just how brutal his friend had beaten him. And so he turned to Aaron McKinney and he was like, whoa, 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 stop now, stop. But instead of stopping, McKinney just turned to Henderson and beat him over the head with the gun as well. Henderson's defense really tried to portray him as a victim of McKinney's as well. It was like McKinney was controlling Henderson and then they both murdered Matthew together. But I don't know, Russell Henderson's team were just trying to say that he was innocent and that he was like under duress by his friend. But I don't think anyone believed that for more than 10 seconds. I mean, he was very clearly complicit in it. He held down this man. It was part of his idea to pretend to be gay and then pick him up and rob him. You know, he was very much in the wrong just as much as McKinney was. In fact, it was Henderson that actually tied Matthew Shepard to the fence. So he was enabling this. Maybe he didn't have hold of the gun, but he was facilitating it. He was making it easier for his friend to murder this boy. Although police did very much acknowledge that Aaron McKinney was the worst one of the two, they understood that Henderson didn't actually grab that gun and hit Matthew Shepard with it. And so for that reason, Russell Henderson was offered a plea deal. They told Henderson that if he gave evidence against his friend, Aaron McKinney, if he snitched on McKinney, then he wouldn't be put up for the death penalty. He would still potentially get life in prison, but at least he would keep his life and Henderson grabbed that opportunity with both hands. He told police absolutely everything about his side of the attack and everything that Aaron McKinney was doing. So then they actually had all of that evidence to be able to take to McKinney's trial. So Russell Henderson was eventually found guilty of the first degree murder of Matthew Shepard. And for that, he was given two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. So although he wasn't up for the death penalty, he was still gonna spend the rest of his life behind bars. The judge ended Henderson's trial saying, you are not a victim here, Mr. Henderson. You are a perpetrator. The court does not believe you feel any true remorse in this matter. The next person to be trialed was Chastity Paisley, Russell Henderson's girlfriend, the one that lied, gave police a fake alibi. She was of course found guilty of being an accessory to murder because, I mean, how could she not be found guilty of that? It also emerged in that trial that Chastity had actually helped her boyfriend, Russell Henderson, to get the blood out of his clothes I suppose they missed the jacket, but out of his t-shirt and his trousers and stuff. And so for all of her parts in this murder, lying about the alibi, cleaning her boyfriend's clothes, she was given a year and a half in prison. Aaron McKinney's girlfriend, Kristen Page, remember she, she never lied to police. She was actually very cooperative, very good with the police. The only issue was that she hadn't gone to them sooner when her boyfriend came in covered in blood saying he'd killed someone she didn't tell police at the time. And so for that, she was tried for a misdemeanor for interfering with a police officer. Don't know what that means. <laughs> Not gonna lie to you, don't know what that means. And I don't know if she got any time or a fine or community service or anything like that. I actually don't know what happened to her, so. But the biggest trial in this whole case was of course, Aaron McKinney's. And because McKinney's trial was the last of all four of them, he was put in like a temporary prison for the time being. And in this prison, Aaron McKinney became something of a celebrity among the other inmates, among these other homophobic men. They were praising him for what he'd done to Matthew. They were high-fiving him. They were saying good job for what he'd done. They wanted his autograph, one of which he even signed killer. On October 12th, 1999, exactly a year to the day of Matthew Shepard's death, Aaron McKinney's trial began. It had been rumoured for a while, up until now, that Fred Phelps and the Westboro Baptist Church were gonna be making another appearance, this time outside the courthouse. But this time, Matthew's friends and family were prepared. I think it was the LGBT Students Alliance group that he was a part of that came up with this idea, and that was that they were gonna physically block out the protests. And they were gonna do so 
by dressing up as angels in honour of Matthew Shepard. So the group all went and made angel costumes with these massive wings. They made them out of like bed sheets, PVC pipes. It was a proper little DIY job. And then when Fred Phelps and his group arrived and they all got out their signs, the LGBT Students Alliance went and stood in a circle around Fred and his, and his group. And then all at once, the group raised their angel wings and blocked off this group. So none of their signs could be read. No one even knew that they were there because there was just this circle of angels blocking them off. Which I think is just lovely that his friends went out of their way to block off that hate so that his family wouldn't have to see it and deal with it and you know, I think it was just such a nice statement to make in a way. But anyway, back to Aaron McKinney's trial. <laughs> of course, that's what we were talking about. It turned out that when he murdered Matthew Shepard, he was actually awaiting trial for an unrelated charge, I think like a burglary or something. And this really went against him in the murder trial because it clearly showed that he had a tendency for criminal behavior. Like he was a repeat criminal that was only getting worse. But in this trial, Aaron McKinney's defense team decided to take quite an unusual approach. I mean, obviously they couldn't argue that McKinney hadn't killed Matthew because it was clear that he had, there was evidence. What could they say? Instead, they tried to say that Matthew had provoked Aaron McKinney. They tried to blame his robbery, torture and murder on him. Going back to what Aaron McKinney said about when they were in the back of the car and Matthew supposedly sexually assaulted them. Of course, there's no, there's no way of saying whether this was true or not. There's no way of saying what the intention was if it did happen or like what the context of it was. There's really nothing that we can say because we weren't there. But McKinney says that he was sexually assaulted by Matthew Shepard, that he didn't want that and Matthew did it anyway. And that is what spurred him on to murder him. And this is what's known as the gay panic defense. This is a very, very outdated concept, although it is still actually used in some states, which is quite unbelievable when you hear it. And this is when the defendant claims that a member of the same sex made an unwanted sexual advancement on them and it made them so uncomfortable that it triggered them to react with violence, sometimes temporary insanity and sometimes even, in this case, murder. It's almost like a self-defense argument, I suppose. It, the lines are a little bit blurred with this one. This isn't the best example of a gay panic defense because there's also accusations of sexual assault, which would make it kind of more of a self-defense claim rather than a gay panic claim. A typical gay panic defense example is more just like a straight man standing in a bar, a gay man comes over and flirts with him and then the straight man reacts with violence. It's a lot harder to talk about this case in the context of the gay panic defense when there is accusations of sexual assault because then that makes it a sexual assault accusation rather than a gay panic accusation, you know? It's quite a hard one for me to talk about as I'm sure you can imagine. It's quite a hard one for any of us to talk about because none of us were there. But that wasn't the only thing that Aaron McKinney's team said, so moving on. They also said that the reason that McKinney reacted so harshly and drastically is because of his childhood because of the abuse that he witnessed between his parents when he was younger. And they said that all of his current drug addictions and stuff like that, his brain chemistry and stuff, it just was not in a sound frame of mind. And so then this happened and he overreacted. His defense lawyer said McKinney and Henderson basically were just kind of two lost kids that were using meth daily, at least weekly for a long period of time. He also said people who use meth, chronic meth users, lose the ability to rationalize and have all kinds of problems mentally. So the lawyer is basically trying to say that it is a mixture of the gay panic defense and also the fact that he was on all these different drugs. So then as soon as Matthew made a move on him, he wasn't in a sound frame of mind and he reacted with violence. It's a mixture of the two. I don't know how the gay panic defense justifies anything ever. I don't know how that's a thing. It really, infuriates me actually. That a gay man could simply hit on someone, like flirt with someone in a bar 
And then that person could hit them and then justify it in court by saying like, oh, it made me uncomfortable, so uncomfortable. Like, I don't know. But I don't know. Hasn't everyone been hit on by someone at some point in time and felt uncomfortable and not wanted it? How does it suddenly make it okay to react with violence if it's a gay person hitting on a straight person? It just don't make sense. The defence lawyer in this trial also brought up the fact that Aaron McKinney was raped by his bully in school when he was like seven years old, which yes, it would have left him with a lot of scarring, especially surrounding men and sex with men. And the defence lawyer said that when Matthew Shepard touched Aaron McKinney's leg and tried to put his hands down his pants in this car, if that did happen then that would have brought back all these memories, all these flashbacks from when he was raped as a child. And then maybe that is why he reacted the way that he did because he was just trying to defend himself. He was worried that what happened to him before was gonna happen again. Which, you know, would make sense. It does make sense. But also the prosecution said that they don't really back any of this defense that Matthew Shepard sexually assaulted Aaron McKinney. Think about the context. These men pretended to be gay told Matthew Shepard that they were gonna go back to their house for sex. So if he is putting his hand on Aaron McKinney's leg, it's because they led him to believe that that was the way that the night was heading. You know what I mean? There was also the fact, the prosecution brought this up in court, that Matthew Shepard himself was a rape survivor. It wasn't just Aaron McKinney, Matthew Shepard had also been raped and he knows what it feels like to feel in danger, in some kind of sexual danger. He would never, put someone else in that situation. The prosecution just didn't believe that Matthew Shepard would have been forceful and like, you know, making McKinney feel uncomfortable. In fact, the prosecution rounded up this argument by saying that Aaron McKinney, if he was sexually assaulted by Matthew Shepard, he brought it on himself by pretending to be gay in that bar and then telling Matthew that they wanted to go home with him. By the end of his trial, Aaron McKinney was found guilty of felony murder. And just like his friend Russell Henderson, he actually took a plea deal. He accepted two consecutive life sentences to save himself from the death penalty. I don't know why he was offered this. I couldn't actually find that, but that meant that he was serving the exact same sentence as his friend. Neither of them are ever getting out of prison. So that's how all the trials went, but this is far from the end of Matthew Shepard's story because his case changed the world well, mainly America, but Jesus, it changed so much. His murder was very clearly a hate crime. I think that's very easy for anyone to see. I don't know how you could argue that it's not, but like I said, at the time, police just were not accepting that it was. They weren't, you know, saying it out loud that it was a hate crime. And that's because at the time, it actually couldn't be classified as a hate crime. In 1999, the definition of a hate crime was only things that were like religiously or racially motivated. There was nothing about sexuality or gender identity or anything, nothing to protect the LGBT community at all. And so after his death, Matthew's parents, Judy and Dennis, decided to become activists in their son's memory. And they set up the Matthew Shepard Foundation, which campaigned to get homophobia, all these crimes against gender identity and stuff, recognized officially as hate crimes. And they actually still campaign for gay rights and equality and all that kind of stuff to this day in 2021. At first, in 1999, when all of this was set up, the movement, the foundation, all of that, it wasn't very widely accepted because this was a very homophobic, judgmental time. It attracted a lot of protesters, just like Fred Phelps and the rest of his group. There were more groups that would turn up to different demonstrations and campaigns and stuff. It was so hard for Judy and Dennis and everyone else that was helping with the foundation to do what they were doing because so many people were trying to get in the way of that. It actually got so bad that Dennis Shepard actually had to wear a bulletproof vest underneath his suit when he went to go and speak at a conference because they'd had so many threats about what they were campaigning for. In the year 2000, the Matthew Shepard Foundation was finally heard and Bill Clinton attempted to pass a law that would include all forms of LGBT hate under the definition of a hate crime. However, this law was rejected, which I can't believe. I don't know why, I don't know how. 
And this was a major blow to everything that Matthew's family, all his friends, all his loved ones had been campaigning for in the years following his death. But they didn't give up. In fact, Matthew's parents even joined forces with the parents of James Byrd to form the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. James Byrd was murdered in Texas in 1998 by white supremacists who tied him to the back of a truck and drove it along, dragging him behind until he died from the torture. And both of these men's families went into activism following their deaths. And now that they joined forces, they were even more powerful. They redefined the Hate Crimes Act. And finally, this included so many more different types of hate that were never accounted for as a hate crime. So different sexualities, gender identities, disability. And this was finally signed into US law by President Barack Obama in 2009. It took a long time, but it was finally done. Judy Shepard even went to the White House for the occasion and she described it as bittersweet. If Matthew Shepard hadn't lost his life in such a horrific, tragic way, then none of this change would have happened. None of this progress would have been made. But at the same time, of course, she missed her son so deeply and she felt so heartbroken over what he'd gone through but look how much good had come out of it. In 2018, so very recent, only three years ago, Matthew's loved ones finally felt comfortable and able to spread his ashes. Now this was something that they hadn't wanted to do for so long. I mean, they held onto his ashes for 20 years without spreading them. And that was due to the risk posed by all of these hateful groups, you know, that protest everything that the family do, or they try and get in the way of all these different campaigns. The family have never wanted to spread his ashes in case these groups find out where Matthew's ashes are spread and then they go down to that site and do anything. They could desecrate it, they could, you know, they could do anything there. But finally, in 2018, they felt more comfortable and confident choosing a final resting place for their son. And that was at Washington National Cathedral in Washington, DC. And there's so many notable, amazing people that are also laid to rest in this same place, different activists, different presidents and stuff like that. So Matthew is in good company. I think that just shows how much of an impact Matthew had on this world, both in his life and in his death, that he was able to be laid to rest among such great people because he himself is one of those great people. In fact, the service that took place to be able to spread Matthew's ashes here was presented by the first openly gay bishop in that area. But that is all I have for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll leave some links down below in the description if I can, if I can find any of the work that the Matthew Shepard Foundation is doing right now, if I can find a way for you to donate or anything, I'll leave them down below, so make sure you check the description. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember, they are very kindly offering you guys a huge discount off of a two-year plan, plus four months free on top of that. All you have to do to grab that offer is go through my link, which is down below in the description, nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor and use the code Eleanor at checkout. A huge, huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting me and helping decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the link to do so in the description or you can click the join button if you're on a desktop. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below because that would really help me out. If you want to subscribe, there'll be a link to do so right here. If you want to subscribe to my second channel, there'll be a link to do so right here. And if you want to watch another true crime video, there'll be a playlist on the screen right now. Bye!